Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Brookings. I'm Michael Hanlon. It's an exciting time to be talking about Columbia, and we have a remarkable panel here today to do so. I think you know the folks up on stage with me, but let me introduce each one of them briefly, and then we'll proceed to have a bit of a discussion, uh, beginning with Juan Carlos Pinzon Bueno, who is just off the campaign trail and had previously been Colombia's ambassador to the United States, and before that, Colombia's Minister of National Defense, a uh, long-standing important figure in Colombian uh, public life and security and relations with the United States and so forth. So I guess I'm already introducing him just as I uh, welcome him to the stage. Um, just to prove the old point that even if you're a bad teacher, you still have great students. He was my, he was my student at Princeton over a decade ago, or roughly a decade ago, in between service in the Uribe and Santos administrations. He was vice minister of defense for President Uribe and uh, then minister of defense after being chief of staff for President Santos. There were a number of us who hoped that the triangulation would catapult him to the presidency of Colombia, because certainly having served honorably and having good rapport with both of those distinguished presidents would seem to be a nice way to have a broad following in Colombia. But uh, polarized politics being what they are in some countries, and I guess we know what that's like here in the United States, uh, that, that, that triangulation strategy didn't quite work, at least not this time. Uh, but he still nonetheless has a lot of observations and insights to share with us about that experience as well as about the future of his country. Uh, Vonda Felbad Brown has been a longstanding expert on Colombia. Her first book, Shooting Up, has an important case study and chapter on Colombia. She's been engaged in the broad question of counter-narcotic strategy, counter-insurgency strategy, transnational crime, uh, thinking about the interaction of those issues with economic development, and has stayed very engaged in the Colombian debate ever since uh, that first book a decade ago, including some excellent blog entries that you can find out on the table if you haven't already read them. So I'm delighted to be up here with my two good friends uh, and uh, colleagues. What we're going to do, as I say, is begin with just some questions from me. And I want to really just ask uh, Juan Carlos, uh, Ambassador Pinzon, to tell us a little bit about what it was like to be on the campaign trail, what his takeaways were. As you know, we're only two weeks away now from the inauguration of, of President um, Ivan Duque. Uh, very. Uh, promising time in Colombia, and yet also a time fraught with uncertainty, with rising drug production, with a somewhat frayed peace process two years in uh, to that deal with the FARC. A lot of questions, a lot of pitfalls, as well as promise for this great country and great ally of the United States. And I'll just say one last final personal note, which is that uh, in all the different countries I study around the world, I'm not really a Latin America expert, as any of you who know me <coughs> are well aware, uh, but I've been extremely impressed by the us Colombia alliance. I think it's one of the most important and one of the most successful in terms of what each country has helped the other accomplish in these last 20 years, largely during the time of Minister Pin's own service in that job uh, at the Ministry of National Defense. So, Actually, what I'll ask you to do now with me is, is just join in a round of applause as we welcome Juan Carlos Pinzon back to Washington. And please, my friend, the floor is yours to just share some reflections on, on, on what you learned. We'll, we'll talk about a lot of specific issues as we go through the conversation with, with security and with counter-narcotics and so forth. But I just wondered if you could begin with a couple of your personal takeaways on what you saw on the campaign trail. Well, first of all, thank you, Professor Hanlon, for your uh, warm welcome. You're so kind, and you're the professor anyway, right? <laughs> so if I fail this time, you, you, you got a problem with that, right? It's my fault. <laughs> it might be your fault now. You, at this stage in life, you're looking for someone to blame, right? That's, that's <laughs> politics. You know, when you lose, you kind of, you know, who to blame? You know, I was the guy, but why, why I didn't make it? It was that course, that course back at Princeton that did it. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm, I'm happy to be back in town, happy to be back in Brookings. Well, very happy to be joined by Vanda here, who's a real scholar on Columbia issues and, uh, you know, has been dedicated to uh, Columbia for a while now. So thank you for that as well. Uh, the campaign time was very interesting, and I have to confess uh, it's a wonderful opportunity when you have been part of policy for a long time as I've been. I've been in the middle of the most interesting discussions of economic policy, and of course on national security policy, on foreign affairs. And for some reason you think that if you got those three things aligned, you're ready to run the country and you're ready to 
uh, move forward uh, the different set of policies, thinking that your experience and knowledge is what might be required for uh, the country. But then, when you walk the streets, when you get into the towns of, in this case, Colombia, my country, but I encourage this, and I guess there's some similarity on any place in the world, you find that people's problems might be related policy-wise to these issues, but in the real lives, they have their own concerns. And they don't understand this kind of dialogue sometimes. And they feel that uh, we policymakers sometimes might be disconnected from real life issues. That's a, an observation I found. And that led me to a second point. That's where populism is risky. Because there are some people that do not care about policy, but decide that they want to tell everything what, that people want to hear make them happy, you know, uh, somehow uh, take advantage of what is required in those streets and towns, but then they don't tell how they do it. And they hope to raise to power and then try to somehow uh, make it happen. I think those are some of the observations I found. My final thought about this was that uh, and maybe I'm still in the phase of reflecting, right? So I'm still landing, hoping to take off again, right? Uh, but uh, one of the things I found was that you think you help a lot of people in your life. And by some reason, you think that all of these people are your supporters. But suddenly, people move where they feel, you know, they should. And usually, you know, uh, polls bring uh, some of that people even against you. And that was a surprising observation to me because I was, you know, educated in a world of loyalty, a little bit more into the military world where my family comes from. And I always kind of thought that building these kind of loyalties was going to be very important for politics. Doesn't matter very much, I can tell you. <laughs> Although I'm sure you were not, one last point, I'm sure you weren't shocked, even if you were somewhat surprised, given some of the polarized politics with President Uribe, President Santos, their relationship, any of the other dimensions and tensions within Colombia, you probably weren't shocked to see that some of these things could happen, even if you were a little disappointed. No, and, I, and it was a little bit of a, a decision by choice, in this case, uh, from my side. Because, you know, if you put yourself in the scenario of a First World War, trenches war, I was in no man's land. Yeah. I was not in the trench of Santos. I was not in the trench of Uribe, and definitely I know I, I was not in the trench of uh, a little bit more extreme left. So I decided to create uh, our own story, you know, from scratch. And I think that was a good point at the end. I think that's the capital we put to the future, that we want to really connect from these uh, stratospheric policy concepts that I have, you know, developed, now connecting to real people, you know, and walking the streets and getting to know the people personally and trying to see how these two things can be done in the right way. And I think this is an investment, I hope, for the country. Even, even I think you gotta go beyond me, frankly speaking. Great, so uh, Fonda, before we get into specific questions of security, the state of the peace process, the state of uh, counter narcotics, et cetera, I wondered if you had some broad observations of just where you see Colombia at this moment in its history as well. well <clears throat> You know, um, one of the things that struck me about the election was actually not so much the polarization. I mean, to some extent it was the case, but um, in my view, a healthy development uh, was some of the coalescing of the left. Mm -hmm. Colombia's uh, historic problem over several decades now has been tremendous fragmentation and weakness of the leftist party and of the left. And whatever one's personal uh, political inclinations are, that's just not healthy for a country. And increasingly, um, you would see Colombian politics consistent with politics in Latin America and now more globally, often operating around um, particular individuals who create, um, um, who create electoral vehicles for the election campaign without really a lasting political party, without lasting systems of mobilization. Now, such system of mobilization can become very ossified mm -hmm. in the eyes of prime example. But at the same time, just simply constant um, 
mobilization around individuals also creates problems such as around populism. So I thought that the uh, coalescing uh, of the left and their ability after a very long time to put together, um, uh, essentially to unify behind Gustavo Petro. And uh, although he was defeated quite resolutely, nonetheless, by the standards of Colombian politics, the left performed very well and he had some solid support. And that, in my view, is a very healthy development. So let me, before I get into specifics, ask each of you what you would say is sort of the biggest challenge facing Colombia today. And then that'll just give some structure to our ensuing conversation. Obviously, we all know the candidates, uh, or most of the candidate issues, uh, between the state of the peace process, the growth of the economy, the interrelated question of counterinsurgency, counter-narcotics, rural development, all these things are going to be part of your answer, I'm sure. But I wondered if you wanted to prioritize and just give us some structure to our conversation and to, you know, President Duque's agenda as he takes office. Juan Carlos, if I could start with you. Oh, very well. I think, uh, first of all, President Duque requires a lot of support. As the competitor I was uh, against him, as someone that will know be part of the government, but also as a person that is interested in the future of the country and hoping to see the country moving forward, I think uh, as much of us that can back government efforts is necessary right now and is important. And that will be, first of all, a little bit more a political statement than, you know, a, 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 a answer to your question. I think he needs support because the agenda, and now moving to that, has several challenges that require to be uh, considered and tackled. Let me start by the obvious elephant in the room, the peace process, mm -hmm. how to handle it. Well, President Duque has said that he wants to keep the peace process, that he will not shatter it, but at the same time, he was elected by an agenda to enhance the peace process. And enhancing the peace process has several requirements and challenges. One, on the justice side. He has mentioned that it's very difficult to understand that if the transitional court concludes that members of the guerrilla in Congress are responsible for crimes against humanity, they can stay there. Well, that's the first uh, issue he has uh, presented very clearly. Second, he has said, and that's the agenda that Colombian people uh, supported, that uh, Drug trafficking as a crime cannot be considered a political crime. That's a very second strong point in the agenda. Third, implementation. He, as I think every, I guess this is a consensus now in Colombia, the kind of implementation of taking development into rural areas has become a very serious issue, frankly speaking is not moving, is not advancing, and in consequence, is the real thing that is putting at risk the credibility of any effort uh, uh, in the accords. And fourthly, he has stated, and on this I'm, frankly speaking, a, a strong supporter, that we need to find an effective counter-narcotics policy. The decisions that were made some years ago that uh, publicly I opposed, and on this, I have to be fair, uh, on stopping the policies we had without really having a policy to replace. It's not that you are in love with the previous policy, it's that we replace it with nothing, and that nothing has been consequential. We have more hectares of coca and cocaine than ever. Of course, there's a big debate. Is cocaine problem a, an issue of Colombia? We have always stated that clearly, no. It's a global problem. But is there a mood internationally to solve this uh, in a way that legalization or something like that will happen? The answer is no. In the meantime, as we speak, this coca cultivation results in a serious challenge for the country because that creates the money for corruption, for crime, for new, uh, for restructuring terrorist cells that were basically defeated or demobilized. So the challenge is serious. Even in the streets, Colombia has become a country that has more consumption than we were used to. And this is creating a real social issue beyond 
uh, a national security challenge. Not to tell that other countries in the region, our neighbors, and even in Central America, are now seeing the Colombia coca issue as an excuse for some to have a, a, a tough position against Colombia, or others simply to blame Colombia for their own diseases as is happening in some countries in Central America. So we need to tackle this in an effective way. This is a big discussion. Yep. By the way, that requires a total different panel on what to do, but this is a real discussion. Now, moving from peace process, I think there's a very important issue of keeping our economy healthy, sound, but at the same time, creating conditions for competitiveness. When you look to productivity in Colombia, we have fall into a trap of productivity now for some like 10 years. Productivity doesn't evolve, actually uh, has been uh, stagnant in a way. And when you look into the future, due to the you know, declining uh, or aging population, it's going to decline. So what we need is a real shock on education, on technology, on infrastructure, on logistics that can really you know, empower productivity and, you know, allows Colombia wonderful endowment to really become competitive and, frankly speaking, to the world, to the region, and to our own people for jobs, income, etc. But connected to that, of course, is the whole macroeconomic environment. Uh, in order to make sustainable our macro policies, we will have to take to Congress very uh, complex reforms, a uh, one that we have been discussing for years and decades, you know, the balance and well-thought tax reform. That's the intention of every government I can remember, every minister of finance. We haven't been able to do that. How are we going to do it now? Well, here's a big intention now. How do we do it? And then on the other side, on the expenditure side, we have to think about the pension reform. Pension reform can be thought from economics, but also from a social stance. If you think that in Colombia, around half of the people do not get any kind of pension or any kind of uh, government support when they get to pension age, it's a very delicate social issue. And when you think we're aging as a nation, despite we're very young, you know, we have to, when you talk about pension reform, you've got to think 50, 100 years ahead, you know, and we really are entering into a risky area. So that's very important. On the other side, well, we're spending something like 15% uh, uh, of total budget every year just paying pensions, and it's growing by the year. So it's a real challenge. I mention all these things to end with a final thought. Politics. <coughs> Vanda saw it as a great news uh, that the uh, you know, radical left has become stronger. For us, it's a concern, for some of us, because not all the members of that left are social democrats, as we expect. You know, as you think about uh, uh, the Socialist Party in Spain, or the Socialist Party in France, or, you know, that kind of political organization that are respecting democracy. Some of them are from a school of thought related to what has happened in Latin America recently with extreme populism uh, behavior. So, it's not to rule them out, it's not to uh, discuss how not to include them, but it's how not to allow that Colombia, you know, falls into an inconvenient track. How to be successful uh, in economic development, in reduction of poverty, in uh, equality, in security, in keeping peace with the advancements that I described, and moving the country steady. And here's where, you know, keeping strong majorities in Congress is going to be important. Here's where, you know, leading in an effective way, being inclusive, is strategically important for the country. You know, beyond specific results, is for stability. So I think President Duque has the conditions to lead. I think we need to support him, you know, in general terms as a, as a nation. And as I said, in my case, just to, you know, answer that question, I will not be part of the government, but I feel we need to be patriotic right now. And 
to this new generation oppose a little bit of what we're seeing in other generations in Colombia, but also here, even in the United States, that campaigns never end. Governments take office and the political feud continues. I'm not criticizing any or others, but it's happening in Colombia too. We have this struggle between Santos and Uribe that is really costing unnecessary to the, to the, to the country. So the next generation, I think we need to be more you know, down to earth and see about problems, see about the future of the country rather than our own personal uh, political uh, hopes and expectations. That's like, the way I think we need to behave. Fantastic. Fonda, a lot on the table already. Uh, so feel free to comment. We can break those issues down one by one. Uh, Ambassador Pinzone's given us a lot to think about with the peace process, with counter-narcotics, rural development, and broader economic uh, growth. I don't know if you want to tackle each one of those in the next answer or just go one by one, but over to you. I, I won't get into uh, all of them right now. I hope we can do so. We might have um, you know, somewhat of an exchange on, on many of these issues. Um, for me, the fundamental point for Colombia is exactly the same before the elections as it was after the elections. And that is whether the country will actually manage to overcome the historic exclusion and impunity and bifurcation of the country that have really defined it between the thriving uh, urban um, center, it's not simply center, but between the thriving urban areas roughly and much of the very neglected, very undeveloped, oftentimes festering um, periphery. The peace accord provided um, a unique opportunity and provided some very concrete commitments as to how to bring about the greater inclusion and integration of the country. It was always bound to be extraordinarily difficult to uh, implement it effectively and to develop the wherewithal to do so. And I think that is even more questionable now after the outcome of the elections. To what extent will uh, President-elect, soon to be President Ivan Duque, really have the full commitment and wherewithal uh, to push for the implementation of the accord, not simply in the letter, but in the actual spirit, that often will clash with some of his core constituencies. You know, in a sense, Colombia president. Uh, 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 president candidate uh, uh, Pinzon, I was going to uh, give you the election. So, oh. Minister, Minister Pinzon. I'm missing you now. Uh, Minister, right? Minister Pinzon uh, spoke about uh, taxation, very fundamental issue for Colombia. For historically, um, labor is taxed very heavily and capital is taxed very, very little. What that leaves then is production, when successful, when you have economic growth, very little job generation. Labor is taxed very heavily, land is taxed very little. What it lands to is uh, appropriation of land, vast accumulations of land that's often left fallow, uh, with, uh, again, minimal opportunities for the very significant segments of the population that have no education, have historically been tied to land, perhaps displaced from it. And so, you know, it is really this fundamental issue. Will Colombia, will the better off, the wealthy, but also the middle class in the cities be able to decide that the reduction in violence as it has been accomplished, it's not sufficient, that really what needs to take place is just a much deeper integration, connection, inclusion of the country, or will it not? And I think that with the, pres with the presidential outcome, there are some real reasons to be worried um, about um, how much will be just put on the back burner, how much will stagnate, to what extent budgetary cuts will um, hollow out the already very slowly creeping um, key aspects uh, of the peace deal. And this is already taking place with some rising insecurity. Broadly, um, uh, Colombia is much safer. The, the, the reduction in murders, reductions in violence are dramatic compared to a decade ago. But there's been significant rise in all kinds of insecurity um, compared to two years ago in, in the last year. Uh, and in my view, this will just be worsening temporarily anyway um, in the foreseeable future. Let me stay with you for one more minute and then invite Juan Carlos also back uh, to respond however he wishes. But I want to uh, ask a little bit more specifically on 
counter narcotics, given that that's been your original entree into the Columbia debate in terms of your published work, and because it's also such an important moment. And of course, this relates to all the other issues you've been talking about too. But how do you assess the current state of the uh, transnational criminal and counter narcotics effort in Colombia, Vonda, and what's the most important next step that should be seriously considered? So I think that the expansion of coca in Colombia is not at all surprising. It's inevitable outcome after almost all um, reduction in violence and um, reduction in insecurity. We saw exactly the same thing in Afghanistan. And it's inevitable outcome of reduction in violence because um, vast scale um, illicit crop cultivation is often underpinned by a series of structural conditions, a significant one of which is insecurity, but others which have to do with uh, minimal economic opportunities and paucity of livelihoods. And so we should have expected what would happen, some of us did, and we should uh, take a deep breath and react to it with calm and with historic knowledge of what works in reducing illicit economies. Unfortunately, there is very little of that kind of patience, in my view, wise patience, here in Washington, um, as well as elsewhere. Certainly, there was a lot, during the campaign, there was a lot of criticism in Colombia of the expansion of coca. I don't believe that forced eradication without alternative livelihoods being in place is a strategy that will um, accomplish lasting reduction in uh, coca crop cultivation. It has never accomplished it anywhere. We will see periods when, for example, spraying with drones, which is now being talked about, might suppress production, but eventually production will go back up unless the underlying structural issues have been addressed they will take a long time to address. So we can be, um, and, and the peace accord um, specified elements, we can get into the uh, nuance and the details of the plan. The one policy that I think is deeply misguided, but consistently repeated in Colombia over and over and over, is the so-called zero coca approach, which demands that for a community to qualify for rural development, the entire region, the entire area, however that is defined, needs to eliminate all coca. Now, uh, and only then will it qualify for sustained aid. Now in this case, there is a little bit of a twist. Once the uh, uh, coca is eliminated, well actually before the coca is eliminated, families in that area get the first installment of, uh, of a payment of what is altogether $12,000 over a period of two years. So there is a little bit of a priori cushion given. But even so, uh, the outcome is that inevitably there is a big drop in, um, in uh, economic livelihoods income before any legal crops, before any legal alternative livelihoods can really start realistically uh, materializing. And so the, this approach has been tried and failed and failed and failed in Colombia, yet it is once again the core operating principle of it. Eradicate all coca in the region, then you will get some uh, uh, some assistance, which in this case is also tied to building roads and thinking about uh, local um, consultative development of broader um, value-added chains, some broader issues. They are simply right now in the consultative stage. It yet remains to be seen what the Duque administration will do, will do with, those, uh, with those administrative plans. There is already a lot of talk about specific bureaucratic Maneuvers switching to Ministry of Agriculture, in my view, very unwise move, and we can talk about it. But my, the big takeaway that I would like you to say that the countries that have been most successful in sustainably reducing illicit crops were countries that had the opposite sequencing, that allowed some development to take place for a number of years and only then started eradicating. Or if there is strong feeling that some eradication needs to take place, in my view, it's very unwise to demand all coca going down in an area and only then starting development. It should be much more uh, matching step uh, uh, now that is um, not palatable, that's not what Washington wants to hear, that's not what Bogota wants to hear. Uh, but uh, I would be very surprised if after the 20th time it finally produced uh, 
good outcomes. So I should give the ambassador a chance to respond sure. on that subject. <laughs> I was, you know, every word Vanda was saying, uh, you know, it made me, made me think. First of all, I think Vanda approach is part of the, you know, the discussion. And I think I will not oppose to what you said in terms of uh, that should be part of the effort, as you describe it. Uh, and I think uh, is, is valuable. But I have to be very honest with you. First, I don't like to talk about coca or cocaine. I hate that subject. Because Colombia is a lot more than that. Mm. You know, our country is a 50 million country, one of the richest countries in biodiversity, water, natural resources, you know, young, wonderful people, wonderful sportsmen, wonderful people in culture. And unfortunately to the world, despite all the efforts, we usually go out and end it talking about this issue. But as much as I don't like it, I understand we have to confront it. And this is what a, a generation of successful men and women have tried to do. And in a way, by confronting that reality, we have been able to shift that country that was in Nice by the end of the 20th century to a country that, of course, today is full of challenges. And you know there are many. But this that was one of the challenges we were really controlling suddenly by a, a set of wrong decisions have proven to come back as an issue. And it is such an issue that now, after years in which the relationship between the United States and Colombia was, the, in essence, talking about geopolitical challenges, geoeconomic challenges, you know, thinking through is going back to how many hectares of coca Colombia has. And this is worrisome and challenging. Now, from Colombian perspective, the reason why we should care about this issue is for two reasons. Probably I said at the beginning, because internationally nobody wants to solve it as a global problem. At the end, it's a problem of consumption, and the question is, you know, how do you uh, regulate such kind of market? Well, the world has not accepted it as a a market, it is an illegal activity, and suddenly that illegal activity results, in the case of Colombia, in funding for crime. All kinds of crime, as I said before, from political corruption to terrorism, and everything in between. This is why in Colombia, this is not a, an academic issue. This is an issue we need to confront, otherwise criminals, bad actors, fund their lives with that money, and suddenly they have irregular armies and even criminal bands in, in cities ready to put at risk not the state, the people, which is what matters at the end, the people. So I get enthusiastic about this because of course I probably am one of the most critic persons on what has happened in the coca uh, issue. And the reason is simple. During my tenure as Minister of Defense, we had the lowest numbers in coca and cocaine production ever. And it was not my, uh, my policy, it was not because of me. It was because we worked for 15 years, strongly, in a disciplined way, of course with a lot of sacrifice. By coincidence, when I got into this room, suddenly someone that I respect and admire very much came in and said hello. That person was the person that led all this eradication for Colombia and for me as minister. I was surprised, and this was a good coincidence. Later I'll let you know, so you can talk to him and learn you know, on, on that side of the story. So when I think everything we did, we knew, going back to Vanda's point of view, that forced eradication was necessary, especially to tackle the criminal finances, but then that you require a more integrated approach, a concept in which you give alternative crops and development to the farmers, to the people. We have been successful in doing that in certain per parts of Colombia. Remember, Colombia is not uh, the size of Maryland or Virginia. We're the size of California and Texas together. So in an area like California, we don't have any crop. But in the area 
like Texas, we have a lot of crops. And you have to think about that even for geography reasons, etc. Why in some area we have been able to get rid of, of illegal crops? Because there we have roads, security, state presence, and frankly speaking, an alternative economy. Why in the other area we take it down, but the chances of that raising up you know, happens? We don't have roads, we don't have infrastructure, we don't have enough uh, manpower presence, and suddenly, you know, this is a cat and mouse game. What we need to think to the future, of course, is, yes, we need to offer alternative development to all these uh, families and people, which means you need to buy the crops in, the, uh, in their own farms, as coca, uh, you know, as mafias do with coca. We need to see in what parts of the country we can do roads. We need to see how much we can keep the security. There is no coincidence on what I'm going to tell you. Exactly in the areas where the FARC make presence, those are the areas that now supposedly, or in essence, they demoralize, but those are the areas where coca skyrocketed. The mistake, incentives. Of course, I have a biased view from my economic background, but I do believe strongly in incentives. When you offer people money, you know, people react. So what happened? We said, voluntarily, you can eradicate your crop and you will get some like uh, 10 times more money than you were getting before when we forced you. What people did? Well, they got the money, they eradicated from their lands, but they went to the backyards, and I mean natural parks, and fill those parks with as much coke as they could. So they're in the two, in the best of worlds. They get money for the, for the state for eradicating, but then they go and cultivate it not far from their lands. What should happen? I think we need to offer, as I said before, a strong set of alternatives for them to have crops, legal crops. I need to guarantee, I think we need to guarantee we buy those crops, so they can have a sustained uh, income to compete with crime. But the other part is very important. We need to tell them that it's absolutely prohibited to have illegal crops. Because if they think they can have the two things, they will do. You know, it's, it's a matter of incentives. It's rational for these families. We need to break that rationality by explaining, as we did in the past, you cannot have the two things. You are in the size of law or you're not, you know. The reality is that we move from these 48,000 hectares of coca in the year 2013 to having today 200,000 hectares of coca. We move from having 300 tons, metric tons, uh, 350 metric tons production of cocaine to 950 metric tons today. That is funding. You know, imagine how much money that implies. When we look at that time, we seize 50% of the total cocaine production. So it implied, really, they were exporting around 150 to 200 tons. Now, we are estimating some like 40% of seizures. So it's a lot higher in terms of seizures. So they're almost uh, uh, seizing some like uh, 450, 500 tons of cocaine, but they're exporting 400 tons. So they're exporting some like twice or you know, 2.5 times more than they used to do in the past. With the price, with a little decline, mainly stable. Imagine what that money does to Colombia. You know, we're coming back to reorganize uh, dissidents. We have now people from the FARC that uh, demobilize but have to return. And we have new bands and we have, you know, these kind of challenges. This is why I think we need to support President Duque's agenda. He was elected for that agenda and he needs to tackle this problem in order to stabilize the country. Now, final thought on this. I know already 
that the narrative of some people will be, okay, once we start the process of eradicating those hectares and making a new policy, there will be friction. I mean, you don't get into a coca field and you expect that they will, are going welcoming you to allow to take that. Mexican mafias are there. The former FARC are there. The ELN is there. The former uh, paramilitary or, or new criminal bands are there. They want to fight for it. So when you get there, you have to confront. Sure, you have to do it in an effective way. You have to do it in a, in a very delicate way and chirurgic, if, if that work works for this. You know, in a very effective and chirurgic way. But not expecting to have that friction is impossible. Now here comes the political narrative. Some will say that the new government is opposing to peace and destroying peace because they are trying to bring rule of law to these areas. Be aware, it's rule of law. It's not against peace. It's against those criminals. It's against that challenge that can result in deteriorating Colombia again. And this is what we cannot do. We need to advance. We need to move to the future, to that country I pictured at the beginning. And this is why I don't like to talk about coca or cocaine. We have a lot more. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm about to go to you, but I want to uh, pose one more brief question to my panelists and uh, start with Vonda, and she may want to respond also to th this ongoing discussion on counter-narcotic strategy. But, but my more specific question is, what's the main thing the United States and more generally the international community should be looking to do now with Colombia? We're sitting here in Washington. Uh, obviously, the U.S.-Colombia partnership and alliance is very important to all of us. And so I'd like to put that particular point on the last question I have for you two before we go to all of you for your, uh, your thoughts and questions. So, Vonda, over to you, please. Oh, thank you, Mike. That actually does tie very much with the counter-narcotics discussion. Let me, say, uh, let me start by saying what Washington should not be doing, which is exactly what it has been doing similar to hammer for more and more uh, forced yeah. aggressive eradication. There is forced eradication going on in Colombia now. There was last year. Um, it's manual, mostly manual eradication. Aerial uh, spraying has been suspended, and already the outgoing Santos administration authorized spraying with drones, which we can get in the Q&A into what advantage and disadvantages drones had over other forms of spraying. But Washington is simply obsessed with uh, the coca cocaine numbers, often very spuriously tying overdose issues, mostly related to fentanyl, uh, to cocaine. Uh, we can also have a conversation about what the rise of synthetic drugs means for the United States and what it means for the world. Um, very interesting changes um, ahead, um, Brookings. Uh, I have done a um, good body of work on that. We had a major event on it uh, about two months ago now, but we can explore that, what it means for Colombia, what it means for the world. What Washington should be doing is engaging with Colombia into how to sustain inclusion and equitable development, a lot of which centers on the rural areas, some of which also centers very much on urban areas. And there is, you know, um, Minister Pinzon spoke about um, eradication promoting rule of law. That might be the case, but that's not necessarily seen by how it is, uh, that, but that is not how it is necessarily seen by hundreds of thousands of poor rural Colombians for whom uh, illegal crops are the only source of livelihoods. And to the extent that they can buy into the state, they need to believe that the state is bringing them basic human security a core element of, of which, of course, is um, food security, this basic economic subsistence. We are really not even talking under the existing plans about social mobility and economic improvement. We are really talking about finding ways to um, provide livelihoods that are perhaps just slightly lower than the livelihoods linked to coca. That's really the extent of what the programs as they are so far can, um, can afford, and, and often they really provide far less. So this for me is really the core, the core issue. Will it be about the growth of center part of Medellin and Cali and Cartagena, or will it be about social equity and inclusion of the country for the first time in decades? Thank you, and Juan Carlos, the same question to you, please. So I think it's very important 
that the United States supports the Duke administration as has supported the past uh, four or five administrations in an effective way. On my time as ambassador here, uh, Plan Colombia as we knew it came to an end. And a new program, a new package, uh, Peace Colombia, uh, was structured. To me, it was Plan Colombia 2.0. And the way I could put it in a way is we moved from 70 30, 70 security 30 uh, social support, as Banda describes, to something like uh, 60 40. 60% 60 now on social issues, 40% on security. I think it's a balance uh, set of numbers. But moving from speech into operational matters, we have a real challenge. If we want to really reuse those hectares of coca in an effective and uh, fast way, definitely. When we talk here about uh, 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 alternative crops and uh, social investment in those areas, we really need to handle these with an effective and detailed planning, area by area. I'm not against that, Van Dan. Uh, on this point, I, um, we kind of separate, but then we get into the, into the same connection. Because it's not this or that, it's both, in my opinion. This is an integrated effort. On that regard, we need to plan effectively, because having the right speech by saying, hey, we need to take uh, development and social solutions to these communities. Well, it's true. And I think we have been saying that for several years. But we have never been as effective as we should, especially on the most isolated and far away areas of the country. We need to do that. But on the other hand, we need to reestablish every necessary capability for our rule uh, of law enforcement uh, agencies to be effective in the land. Aerial spraying is a big debate. Do we have to keep it or not? Do we lose that? Uh, I mean, what should we be doing to the future? My opinion, aerial spraying was a tool. As an isolated tool, was not good enough. And by the way, had declining returns for that time. If we were to use it today, I can assure you that in certain areas, the size of the coca crops are so large that the returns will be very high again. But second, every time we did manual education, what we were doing was putting at, at risk the life of policemen, soldiers, and uh, manual civilian eradicators. So that's why having the tool of aerial spraying was effective for certain areas. I don't think we should go back to a massive national uh, aerial spraying. We don't need that, by the way. But we need to do a very focus, depending on cases, to use the tool when necessary. It's the only way we can you know, really reduce that in an effective way. But at the same time, what we cannot do is repeat the mistakes of the past. You spray, you do no, nothing. Now, you eliminate coca in certain area manually, with drones, with uh, uh, aerial spraying, whatever the tool you use, that's a tool. But same day, same hour, you have to be doing the social program that guarantees new source of income for these families. I think that's the whole concept. Otherwise, you know, we will be even seeing an increase. And let me explain one thing. With unofficial numbers and details, what I got to learn from my former colleagues at the, at the security agencies is that, yes, we are sending more cocaine to the US through Central America, through Venezuela. Yes, we're sending more cocaine to uh, Europe via West Africa. But there's a worrisome story now, in addition to those. That consumption in Colombia is more going up. That consumption in Brazil is going up. That consumption in Argentina and Chile is going up. And that it implies we have new markets for all this. So the problem is not going to come down just because we wait and tell. The problem will keep increasing 
And I insist, I might be uh, boresome a little bit to, to say this, but at the end, for Colombia's point of view, this is money for corruption, this is money for crime, and this is money to, be, to make the country more unstable. So it is a real challenge. Quick last point from Vanda, and then please have your questions ready. You know, whether we're talking about coca or other forms of illegal or informal economies, such as logging that might be illegal or simply... Mining. M mining or logging that's simply in violations of desirable practices by major legal companies, standard problem in Colombia, new land theft taking place once again, standard problem in Colombia, such as for um, all palm cultivation. The issue is really about having an effective state presence that can enforce law against all, including against major agribusinesses, major vested interests. That um, is a part of the issue that has historically not been taking place. That, of course, requires that you have effective policing presence, whether this is police or some sort of rural police or military forces mm -hmm. in large parts of the country, that you have some functioning um, judicial processes not the case in large parts of the country. And th there is simply no way to do so quickly. Hence, uh, you, uh, Minister, have been involved with various of the consolidation plans, strategic zones, their numerous integration. There is simply an unrealistic expectation that all of this can be rolled out across the country at once. What the only way to really feasibly start making headway is to start concentrating on priority areas that is extraordinarily politically difficult because it leads over and over to the issue why some areas qualify for comprehensive state interventions, whether they are inserting policing and rule of law or whether they are inserting socioeconomic developments and others don't. So the tendency because of basic democratic electoral pressures are to do little bit everywhere. And that, however, inevitably jeopardizes development, it never, it never so, social development broadly, it never leads to sufficient consolidation. And it is the issue that Colombia is facing over and over again. So one is the, the basic issue of equity. Will the upper classes, will the middle classes be willing to shoulder far more taxes for a number of generations so that the underdeveloped areas do get development? But will the underdeveloped areas be willing to see very unequal development in their own areas taking place, with some zones um, having uh, far more um, development early on because they're simply more suitable to it? There are some parts of Colombia where nothing other than an illegal crop, other than an illegal economy, will ever be viable. Those areas should be the last to tackle. The ones that should be prioritized are the ones where accomplishments can be reaped. But it goes back to the very d difficult electoral popular issues of why do all these people get the state help and we don't. Thank you. Let's go to you. I want to take two questions at a time. Please wait for a microphone. I see two hands in the back, so let's take both those questions and then we'll come back to the panel, please. And please identify yourself before you pose your question. Hello, my name is June Beidel. I'm with the Congressional Research Service. Um, this is a fascinating discussion. I want to thank all of you for it. Um, my question, given that I cover Columbia for Congress, is the late breaking news of yesterday and what you think the impact of uh, former President Uribe's decision to step down from the Senate will have on the incoming Duque administration. I did give you all a heads up <laughs> that I would probably be bringing this up only because I get the questions. Thank, Thank you. you. And we had one more question, I think, in the row behind you. Yes, please. Good morning. Um, my name is Roberto Bando. I would like to ask if you could uh, uh, comment a little bit on anything related to Afro-descendants, uh, racial and ethnic inequalities, particularly in the Pacific Coast, like Buenaventura, Tumaco, and, and, and other areas. Uh, and also the situation with Venezuela, a little bit more on the Norte Santander corridor uh, as well. Okay, why don't we uh, start with you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, take either, either or both, and then we, Vonda can respond. Uh, ideally, maybe we each take one, but you, know, you may want to comment on, on the second one as well. It's up to you. Uh, well, I will start with the second question okay. first. It's not that I will not answer the other one, <laughs> but uh, I, I want to start with the second one, uh, with the Venezuela issue. I think uh, when I describe the challenges we had, maybe I missed to mention that 
definitely the Venezuela uh, challenge for Colombia and what is going on in Nicaragua are two issues that are important for the new administration, how to handle it. In the case of Venezuela, as you know, it's not only a, a very critical situation that is going on inside, uh, but Colombia is directly affected by it, as Venezuela has been in the past for uh, Colombian situations. This is a border situation. We have seen huge amount of immigration into the country, uh, and that immigration is bringing uh, some sense of uh, frustration from Colombian citizens as well, because that immigration is coming to compete, as happens in other parts, uh, for jobs, for social services, for public services, and even sometimes raises security challenges. That is a, that is a fact. So we need, of course, to create a better and more effective uh, refugee policy for what is going on with Venezuela. But to be practical, you know, this is not a, anymore a, an issue of you know, having a failing or an ending democracy in your neighborhood, but is what the consequence day to day it is implying for Colombia. And of course, it, it, it costs money. It, it has a fiscal impact. And as I said, it has a, a social and security uh, effect. Second, of course, is the permanent threatening, you know, coming out of tough words, uh, coming out of uh, uh, Venezuelan government, especially in the past two years with certain events, provocations, and cases that are important to look at. Colombia understands, and I guess there's some consensus, that uh, we will not fall into provocations, that we are a mature democracy, that we don't play the, we don't follow the playbook of, uh, you know, these people that are that is trying to bring us into their own trap, but it's something to keep an eye. And not to forget that half of the cooking that goes out of Colombia goes through Venezuela. And a lot of what happened is that the connections between FARC, ELN, criminal bands with authorities of certain level in Venezuela by corruption or by government approach is not story, it's a proven fact. So it creates another issue for, for complication. Finally, not to forget that there are only two countries that still have a, a border difference with Colombia, Venezuela and Nicaragua. But what a coincidence. Right now, these two regimes are behaving as they are behaving, having the issues that they have, but in addition to that, with influence of extra-regional powers that probably are here, not because of Colombia, but maybe because even the interests of the United States were, to put in a way, annoying <laughs> your own neighborhood. I leave it onto that just to you know, think through. Of course, the Pacific uh, coast that you mentioned, uh, in which uh, most of the Afro-descendant community of Colombia lives, uh, has been a real challenge for the country in terms of the poverty that we see there and the contradiction of an area full of natural resources, more water than any place in the world you can imagine, uh, very important assets on, for mining, you know, gold, uh, platinum, and other uh, you know, wonderful opportunities. One of the most beautiful areas in terms of environmental endowment. You know, the things that you see there are second to none in the world. And of course, being the Pacific coast, located in the Pacific basin, where everything good of the world somehow is happening in terms of economic growth. And this is a total contradiction. That's, of course, one of the poorest areas of Colombia. In the years to come, I believe we will have to create a, a, an integrated plan specifically for that region. We will have to think through something like that has been thought in some Asian countries, you know, developing everything related to infrastructure, education, and some vision on what should be done. That will require, of course, an invitation to the private sector to feel safe to invest there massively, 
not only Colombian private sector, but definitely, you know, think this in a regional global concept. But I believe it's the only way because the other approach that we have done is trying to solve, as Vander well explained, with small money, putting small money everywhere. Uh, a little bit of this here, a little bit of this here. So at the end, you give the impression you're doing something, but you're not solving anything. So we needed here a macro approach. Now, the tough question, <laughs> because he's the headline of the day. Uh, the headline of the day is related to President Uribe, as you described. I'm going to give you my, my own personal opinion and take. Uh, first, I'm personally always committed to the respect of institutions and to the respect of rule of law and our legal system. So, of course, every citizen has to comply to authorities when they are required. If we want this country to move forward, that's the way we have to. That's, you know, honestly my permanent approach to, uh, you know, to any issue related to institutions. But second, President Uribe has been an important person in Colombia, a contributor to the advances we have had. As any citizen, he has to, of course, comply with his obligations to the law and to the justice. But let me tell you, it's very difficult to explain, especially to kids and to young people, how come that people that you know, committed the worst crimes against humanity can have a regular and wonderful life protected by the state, and how come someone that with all uh, you know, different perspectives you can have about politically that person will have to held such a challenge. In Colombia, we will have to think through on how to balance these kind of situations because we are just trying to pass through a peace process that, by the way, when it was taken to the, to, to the ballot, people voted no. We cannot forget that. And just recently, despite my own aspirations, I have to be clear, the country voted for a president that is representing that agenda that somehow opposes the idea of impunity for these kind of people. So we need to find a balance in Colombia because it doesn't make sense to see someone like President Uribe in such a challenging situation and see these kind of persons that we know them, that everybody knows, you know, without risk or harm. This is where we need to find a balance. I insist, you know, uh, people in Colombia has to confront justice as we are in a democracy. It is what it is, but let's not forget about this dilemma that I'm bringing to you, because this is what is in the mind of many Colombians today. And that creates a public tension friction, if you want, in politics. So if we want to move to the future, we really need to disarm these things and really allow us to focus on the real issues we were discussing here. You know, poverty, inequality, difficult geography and areas, potential of business investment and making Colombia, you know, a country for technology and a country for the future. But if we keep on to these feuds, moving politics into judicial and judicial into politics, frankly speaking, you know, we're going to continue to do this in a slow way. Vonda, care to comment on either of those questions? Sure, just quickly on uh, the um, uh, President Uribe news. You know, I would add that this creates very early on a very interesting dilemma for President Ale Duque, who of course comes from the party that uh, President Uribe created the Democratic Center, and he's the founder of it. The two men have been very close. It was very clear that uh, um, that a lot of the ideas, um, agenda of President, Duke, uh, of, uh, President Uribe were represented by President Duque. And that said, however, in my view, uh, President-elect Duque was never uh, simply a pawn or puppet of President Uribe, as uh, some 
claim during the campaign and try to denounce it. And it would always be a balancing act for him, how close he would stay to his mentor and how much he would need to represent a much broader Colombia. A Colombia where some 40% of people voted differently. And this now puts the tension uh, or, the, or the, the difficulty that uh, the president-elect would have to have resolved during his presidency very early on. Uh, how far he will be able to separate himself from uh, the process and like the uh, judicial processes take place without um, it involving him, whether at institutional level or at a um, simply political level. So, you know, interesting, uh, um, interesting development that I am sure President Alec Duque was really not hoping to have very on uh, on his plate just as President Uribe did not want to face. I just want to add a comment about the um, dissatisfaction with the justice issues that many people in Colombia um, faced. Uh, the referendum defeated the original peace accords by a, a razor thin uh, majority, came very, very close. Nonetheless, the, the referendum um, turned out no. And one of the principal objections for many people was the fact that um, FARC leaders, um, as long as they completely disclose their crimes, pay reparations to victims, uh, will uh, not have to face uh, prison sentences. And uh, both President Uribe and President like, Duque have strongly campaigned against it. It's actually very difficult to undo that. Even if um, new laws were passed, the existing peace accord, that provision is already part of the Colombian law. And even if new laws were passed, uh, Colombia's legal system privileges, guarantees that the law that gives most lenient sentences will be the law that prevails. So it's very hard for President Alec Duque to, in fact, challenge uh, the legal outcomes of what the uh, special jurisdiction for peace would meet out with the expectation that this is not, um, uh, that this is not prison sentences. This is, for example, something like um, house arrest. Where I think the possibility, however, comes uh, to much more active um, effort is to be systematically condemning uh, those <coughs> outcomes and to be systematically pointing out what uh, uh, Minister Pinzon spoke about. How come FARC leadership will have uh, guaranteed seats in Congress after they complete whatever the house arrest, whatever the sentence will be, where uh, people like uh, President Uribe are facing uh, judicial processes, to be systematically mobilizing uh, and creating rancor and resentment uh, against the deal, with the outcome then being far more polarized politics. For many people in Colombia, it's really desirable that the FARC never gets elected, that they perform as poorly as they did in this year's congressional elections. I actually wonder whether that's the case and whether there are not, in fact, significant risks to them systematically performing poorly, whether that will not speed up and exacerbate the problem of defection, particularly as the reinsertion, uh, reintegration has really not been taking place. Uh, you know, the, the demobilization, disarmament have taken place, but integration of um, FARC members, ex-FARC members has really not. I want to spend a little bit of time on uh, the Afro-Colombians, a uh, very important issue, historically very marginalized uh, community. And one of the tragedies is that some of the areas where they reside that have long suffered uh, some of the greatest violence, marginalization, the greatest negative effects of forced eradication, like Choco, like Nariño, are once again back in um, significant increases in violence. Choco, for example, where you have not just Afro-American communities, uh, Afro-Colombian communities, but also indigenous communities, is seeing a lot of intense violence uh, between uh, the ELN, between the Gaetanista, Uribeño, several other groups. Um, and um, the only way to really, well, apart from providing robust security with all the challenges that we spoke about, the, the only way for the Afro-Colombian community to uh, start enjoying some fruits of the peace and justice is to systematically integrate them into decision-making processes. And here is where I am again worried about the Duke administration, 
the, the core parts of the peace accords was that community, that rural development, community development would be bottom up. That communities themselves, like the Afro-Colombian communities, would have a very strong voice as to how development in an area takes place. And President-elect Duque is clearly backing away from it. His view is that uh, growth and um, development should be driven <coughs> by large agribusinesses. Well, I would really like to hear how minorities such as Afro-Colombians will have a voice, will have some uh, uh, opportunity to uh, have their uh, needs met, not simply through handouts, but through actually being integrally part of the development process. And I don't see that in the policies that are being spoken about right now. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more round of questions. So let's see uh, if we can get a couple more here. We've got one about 10 rows back and then one in the third row, and we'll wrap up with those two, I think. Uh, no, you, you just walk past the person I was asking. You, we'll start with her, and then we'll come up to the third row. Hi there, my name is Teresa Welsh. I'm a reporter with DevX, the global media platform. This question is for the ambassador. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on your comments about Venezuela and sort of how you expect the new administration to deal with that issue, if you expect any major changes, um, as the problem next door obviously is not going away anytime soon. Thank you. Great. And then one more up here, please, in the, in the third row. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, my name is Valeria Rincon. Um, this question is also for the ambassador. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about Vonda's point about um, staggering se uh, security or state presence in certain areas um, to maybe increase the effectiveness of it, if you think that's at all possible. Sure. Great. So why don't we do this? Why don't we um, give the floor to you, my friend, since the two questions were posed directly to you, but then also give Vonda a final word of conclusion at the end, and, and please wrap up any concluding thoughts you've got in your answers to these questions as well. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, on Venezuela, the current administration, President Santos' administration, has uh, detached from the policy that they held for some like seven years. Uh, the Colombian government has been, uh, especially the past year, supporting OAS uh, statements and denouncing the situation in the Colombian border, the presence and sometimes cross of members of the National Guard, uh, even few of the army in Venezuela in the past year and a half, I would say. And uh, it has become somehow, despite the uh, political polarization, nobody recognizes when you polarize the other side. I would say the current administration has to start on that to get closer to the incoming administration position. President Duque, as senator, uh, went to the uh, international court to present the case for, uh, you know, the, 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 the break apart of democracy and the human rights violations into the international court against the government of Venezuela. That he did it during candidacy time. Even in my case, I sent to the OAS a letter claiming for the uh, intervention and promotion of terrorism in the case of Venezuela against Colombia, specifically in the case of the ELN. Once President Duque was elected, he came here to Washington. He met the Secretary General of OES, and he made a statement supporting the OES position. I'm giving you some dots in time just to tell you that I think that Colombia's uh, position right now, and on these more and more general consensus on, on, on certain sectors, uh, the Venezuela situation is seen as a real problem for Colombia, and is seen as a challenge on all the layers that I described before. You know, immigration, refugees, security, ELN, criminal bans, corruption, drug trafficking, illegal mining, FARC, also 
uh, the the you know the situation for Venezuelans themselves. Their you know, we are a democratic country, and we, by you know moral high standard, we have to oppose to regimes that are uh, in essence against democracy or prosecuting citizens, you know, without any reason. So I think the stance of Colombia will be clear and will be evident. Now, another line that I think President Duque uh, gave here in Washington that I believe is important, that is consistent with ha what has been the traditional Colombian position onto that, is that Colombia will never be an aggressor to another country and much less to a neighbor and brother of blood as Venezuela is to Colombia. So I think that's an important position. You know, we are not trying to uh, uh, combine or create situations of provocations. We want to have, as a country, a clear line of values, democratic values, and make those clear and respected. But we are not seeking, as a country, for nothing different than that. And of course, we're trying to handle the refugee crisis the best possible way. I think the United States, as we'll need to help with our counter narcotics policy, which I think can be, uh, have an important role into that, we will require other countries in addition to the United States, maybe the European Union, Spain, Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Argentina, to contribute to the refugee crisis of Venezuela that is happening in Colombia right now with more than a million people already inside Colombian territory. That's a real challenge. And I think that's an important uh, issue to mention. On your final question, uh, what if the Colombian state can be brought to isolated areas? I can assure you that we can. And actually, uh, we can make presence of our security forces on every place of the country, any time, any hour, even at night, you know? And that we have done. And we can stay now because we have, uh, I would say, never you have enough manpower, but we have a large manpower that not necessarily is as committed operationally in counterinsurgency warfare as we were in the past. So we can make presence. But unfortunately, as part of the agreements, in certain areas of the country, you know, there was not accepted the permanent presence and deployment of our uh, security services. And I think this is an issue we need to tackle now in an effective way. We need to be very practical. I believe on what uh, Vanda said, you know, if you want to have rule of law, first thing you have to uh, have in place are the security forces capable of ensuring that rule of law? Because then, and this I can tell you, you know, evaluating the rise of policies on taking uh, development to Colombia, this is what we have done for generations now. It's kind of a common language now. Well, what do you need to solve the problems in Chocó? Well, we need education, we need social services, we need equality. The obvious. This is now an operational issue. How do we do it? We have done that in certain places. How do we do it now? In an effective way, because security forces are not the state. It's one piece of the state. We need the other to come. But we need the same kind of planning and the same kind of political will and the same funding as we did it with the other part. And I think Vanda was right on one point. This is not gonna happen only on Duque's administration and will not happen even in, fir in your first year. We need patience. We need to be patient. We, this is going to take 10, 15 years. But what we need is a clear plan, multi-year, that everybody knows and respects. It doesn't matter who's the government. We don't have that yet. And I think we need to you know, focus on that. Honestly, that was one of the things I thought I was going to bring to the table. Frankly speaking, making operational Colombian state. To me, that's even more important in many uh, regards than, than even just keep you know, rolling on the same stories. So I want to end you know, with uh, some comments and well, maybe I should let Vanda and myself. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, 
you know, I would just, I guess, add or, or emphasize that last comment, um, that the, the issue is really how to stay with the basic plan, with the basic commitment, while certainly making adjustments to policies, to approaches that are actually not being effective on the ground, but how to stay with the basic vision. And that to me is not yet obvious that Colombia is really committed to that. What I expect in the Duque administration is not really chucking uh, or throwing away the accords as such, um, but perhaps being very lukewarm in their implementation, playing bureaucratic games with what agencies are in charge of what development and not giving in enough budget. Um, that issue of, of the budgetary commitment uh, is a pervasive problem across the world. It was one of the key issues in Brazil and UPP, for example. Uh, it's a key issue in places like India. Uh, there will be a massive challenge. And I'm not persuaded that that commitment at the societal level, at the political level, there is in Colombia. The downsides of the absence of that commitment is that the peace might simply then become a transmutation the peace deal might simply be, uh, be the start of a transmutation uh, to a different form of conflict. So there are two ways to look at what's happening at Colombia right now. One is that the insecurity, the challenges that we are facing are the very difficult tail end of what uh, the peace accord started. That's the positive outlook, that's the one I want to believe in. But the other way to look at it is that it's not really a tail end, that this is the beginning of different, perhaps more fragmented, uh, more complex conflict that we have seen. Thank you. And Juan Carlos, for a final word over to you, please. Well, thank you so much. You know, we had a, had a wonderful time here back at Brookings. Three final thoughts. One, we need to focus very much on making Colombia attractive for investors. We need job creation. We need sources of income. And we need to make Colombia competitive. And of course, we have all these issues we have discussed today that are things we need to tackle, but we need to not to forget on this big agenda because that agenda of economic growth and investment is the one that can pull and somehow disrupt this stagnation that we have had on the uh, you know, isolated areas of the country. So I think that's important. Second, I think, as I said before, the new generations of politicians, of people that have some level of leadership, need to exercise responsible leadership. This doesn't sound very much uh, attractive because being disruptive is always easier. Using a tough word is always easier. But in countries like mine, I think we need to be patriotic, if I can use that word, and understand that there are problems that are common to all. And that will be good for the country if we advance on those. Third, we need to recognize that there's a new president with a new agenda. And that agenda was the one that won. It was not my agenda. I have similarities. I have points in common. But what we cannot do is defend the agenda that lost, you know, trying to equalize with the agenda that won. No, let's support the agenda that won. You know, let them advance, of course, be critic, balance the agenda when necessary, but let them have a plan and let them have a, a success. I end my comments by saying that, as I said at the beginning, I am independent, I am not part of the Duque administration, will not be, but I can tell that it's important for Colombia to line up as a country, to find points in common and to promote uh, progress. I think President Duque is a decent person, he's a good man, confronting many difficult challenges, many difficult challenges, but we need the country to move forward. We cannot stay in the past. We got to move to the next level, and I think we can. I might sound a little bit chauvinistic, but believe me, we have a wonderful country. We have a wonderful country. It's a country that can do better, that can do well, that in some ways have done extraordinarily well as compared to where we come from. But now, let's seek for the next level. And maybe now that we have a new generation in government, it's the time to promote that push, understanding that you know, taking decisions 
have consequences. And, you know, we, we have to support that in a way. Thank you so much. Great time. Thank you all. Thank you for being here too. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.